Well, we have a really uh, special speaker next. Uh, someone who, if you live in the Princeton area or if you're in the library profession, I'm sure you know her very well, Leslie Berger. Uh, she is the executive director of the Princeton Public Library. And I don't know if they're somewhere, I but get away. she's on the cover of a magazine. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. And that's actually, it's the spring issue of the Princeton Magazine. And it's speaking about the connections of town and gown, technology, privacy, and the vital role the library plays in our community. And Leslie is well known for being an advocate for libraries and bringing tremendous enthusiasm to what she does. And I just want to mention, uh, you know, innovators, uh, leaders, you know, have to see the need for change and then to work really hard to make it happen. And I think one of the things that Leslie has done that uh, I'm really, really impressed by is she actually created some really important change in the American Library Association when she was the president. And it was an organization that was desperately in need of change to become an association for the 21st century, particularly a program uh, in which she, uh, it's called the Emerging Leaders Program, and it gives people that are new to the library profession an opportunity to be involved in a project where they get exposed to leadership skills. And that's really what we needed to uh, secure the future of our profession. So it was just an awesome idea from an awesome person. And you're really lucky to have this opportunity to hear her speak today. Leslie. Okay, here's the magazine cover in case you missed it. We're blowing it up life size. It'll be in the lobby next week. Um, today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how libraries kind of bring everything together that we've been talking about this afternoon. This idea of community, the idea of culture, and the idea that there needs to be this place in our communities where this all kind of converges. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit this, this afternoon about how libraries have really become the modern day agoras and forums in our community and how librarians, not only here in this community, all my wonderful staff, raise your hand if you're in the audience here, how they're building community every day, but how thousands and thousands of librarians and working in public libraries across the United States and I think now around the world really see this as a very central role for what libraries are all about in the 21st century. But before I talk about that, I need to help you understand why I've become so committed to this cause. And I think what we've been hearing here a lot this afternoon is this idea of passion. I've been struck by how um, committed people are to what they believe in, and I think um, that has a lot to do with why I've chosen to dedicate my life, pretty much, to, um, to libraries. So what you need to know about me is that I'm an only child. And when you're an only child, um, you don't have to kind of go out of your way to find people to play with. So my mom, you know, she'd get sick of me whining and she'd say, go out and find somebody to play with. But that was kind of a hard thing to do. It meant you had to actually go outside of the house, like walk on the street, find kids to play with, or pick up the telephone and make a play date, or actually just kind of have friends that were readily at hand. I didn't have brothers and sisters who were kind of my natural built-in playmates. So what did I do? Since it was too hard to do all of those other things, I played with my imaginary friends who lived in books. And so I spent many an hour as a child um, playing with my friends, who happened to be called, named Mary Poppins, or Nancy Drew, or Laura Ingalls Wilder, or Winnie the Pooh, but they were my friends. And they provided me many hours of enjoyment and imaginary playing. But there was one part of my week that was really, really special. And it was our Saturday morning visits to the local branch of the public library, which was about a mile or so from my home. And um, the thing about that was, it, you know, there's this, we all have these moments of, of kind of early imprint about something that stays with us for our entire life. For me, it was the smell of the linoleum, the way it felt under my feet when I walked into that building. It was the odor of the new books and the old books that were glued with that stinky old library glue that they used to make, right? 
We don't use it anymore, thankfully. It was the fans whirring, no air conditioning in the 50s, folks. You know, they had these fans that were whirring overhead, so it was kind of a, a, a local noise, but it, it diffused what was going on in the, in, the, uh, in the building. And then there was that wonderful thing called the Milwaukee Pencil Dater, which no one who isn't a librarian, and probably no one who wasn't a librarian during the 50s and 60s will know what I'm talking about. But it was this little date stamp used first at the Milwaukee Public Library, later um, patented by the Library Bureau. It's, it's set on the end of a pencil, and the librarian, if she was really deft, could kind of do a thing like that, which would get the date due stamp on the book. So those are my memories of this library, and is exactly why I wanted to become a librarian, so I could have a Milwaukee pencil dater, which I have yet to find. Um, but what's really what was more important about that Saturday morning experience um, was the idea that I had of belonging. So I remember, you know, kind of this lonely, only child. I play with my imaginary friends. They're all in books. They don't really talk to me except through the words. But on Saturday morning, I had a community. And I didn't have to go too far out of my way to find that community. It was all there in that library. It was a familiar cast of characters every week. You know, they were the regulars. Um, the, the librarian, who was always the same librarian on duty, who welcomed me when I came in the door. Um, it was a place outside of my home where I felt safe, um, where I belonged, where I could find ready-made playmates with the other kids who might be there reading the books, or for, to talk to an adult who was more than happy to talk to a cute little four- year or five-year-old, probably for the wrong reasons, but we don't need to go there. <laughs> um, but that library, that little library in the north end of Bridgeport, Connecticut, now famous for the Times Square bail bomber, um, um, that little library was for me my community. So now you need to just one more personal story and then I'll move on, I promise. But fast forward to age 21. So, um, and that was just two years ago. <laughs> um, but I'm 21. It's the 70s. I'm a big social reformer. I've marched in the streets. I'm ready to change the world. And I knew, kind of intuitively, because now all along I've been going to libraries my whole life, I knew intuitively that the whole world would be better if only people used libraries and knew all of the wonderful things that we do there, right? It was Now, of course, if any of you grew up in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, you know why people didn't use libraries, right? Because they weren't particularly friendly and welcoming at that point. Um, they kind of looked like boxes, and, and they weren't necessarily a place you'd want to spend your free time. Well, I went to the University of Maryland, and when I was in Maryland, I met Mary Lee Bundy, who I think is probably the greatest library thinker of all time. She was a teeny little chain-smoking woman. Um, but she kind of, she and I connected immediately. Um, she was my teacher, my Yoda, my lifelong library mentor. And um, all of that took place, by the way, at a coffee shop in College Park, Maryland. And she helped me understand very quickly that libraries have the ability to change people's lives and to create community. So now you have a little bit of understanding about how I got here, how I have become kind of the evangelist of libraries as community living rooms movement across the country, and I talk about it whenever I travel internationally as well, and why I believe that libraries are central and vital to um, our community's lives. So libraries have kind of had this interesting journey. If you think about libraries, they really were formed in the beginning for people who were literate, right? People who liked books. They were privileged. They weren't for the masses in the beginning. Um, and they've really evolved from being for the elite to becoming vibrant centers of community life, offering many different ways for people to learn um, and to experience different cultures. And that's what happens here every single day. Um, whether it's text, people coming here to learn through text or learning through a film discussion, um, through a musical performance, from one-on-one -on -one discussions with each other in our cafe or at an event like TEDx. Um, there's a, there was kind of a big aha moment, I think, in the last decade as many librarians finally became aware that the way that we appeal and connect and remain central to the communities we serve is dependent 
on our ability to, to attract a wide variety of customers, not just the readers in our community. And it all seems now to be very obvious, but it wasn't. It took us a lot of years to get to that point, to get to the point where we have libraries like the one you're sitting in today. And if we look back over the great gathering places of history, we have some models that were just there ready for us to take all along. Think about the Greek Agora. Um, what happened in the Greek Agora? It was the central marketplace, the center of community life. You had farmers coming with their produce and selling that. You had merchants coming with exotic um, things for sale. You had families that were interacting with each other, discussing the, the important public issues of the day. You had um, business people who were looking for laborers, connecting with um, uh, people who were looking for employment. Um, people might sit in the Agora and listen to a musical program or engage in theater. So it was all right there. And it kind of sounds like what we do in our library each and every day, right here. And then the Roman Forum, which kind of built on the Agora model, providing a central space in the city for um, commerce as well as public meeting space. There were crowds of people that gathered in the Agora every day. And I read recently that the peak time in the Agora was 11 a.m., which probably has something to do with the Roman sun. But it just so happens that our peak time at the Princeton Public Library is 11 to 1 p.m. Kind of interesting, huh? The piazzas of Italy, the places of France, the placa of Greece, the plots of Germany, the squares, and all of the public parks that have been around the world have been very, very much built on this early model of the Agora and the Forum, providing gathering places for the exchange of ideas and places for communities to gather. And unlike other world cultures, we here in the United States have a somewhat different experience based on the way our cities and our suburbs have evolved. So for many of us who live in the suburbs, and that's certainly true here in New Jersey, um, our life is not based around public spaces as much as it's based around home in our cars, right? So it becomes a big deal to find public gathering places. You have to kind of go out of your way. Someone mentioned earlier the mall. No, the mall's not a public gathering place. Um, you know, I have to make a decision to get in my car and drive 50 miles to go to New York City or drive 50 miles in the other direction to go to Philadelphia or even some evenings to drive seven miles back to Princeton so I can be part of a of a discussion that's taking place here. And it, it requires a little bit more effort to, to seek out places where people are gathering. Um, I spend a lot of my time in Paris, thankfully. I'm very lucky. Um, and I'm always struck every time I go to Paris about how much time people are spending outside of their homes, which is partially because their homes are so small, but also because that, that public gathering, that exchange of ideas in the public forum is very much a part of that culture, whether it's in a French cafe, or whether it's people dancing on the banks of the Seine, um, or picnicking in the park. That's kind of a foreign concept for, here, for us here in America, and I think something that our communities are, are um, much less rich for having missed that experience. So that kind of brings me to the idea of the third place in the community living room. Um, the third place concept, which I think many of you are probably familiar with, was popularized by Ray Oldenburg in his book called The Good Great Place. And he talks about, um, and also by Starbucks, um, who kind of commandeered the concept for their very clever marketing um, effort. And the third place, it's not home, obviously, which is the first place, and it's not work which is the second place and where most of us spend the majority of our time, unfortunately. Um, but it's the place that's considered the anchor of the community, a location that facilitates and fosters broader and more creative interaction. And I often refer to our library as the third place, the community's living room. I heard the restaurant guys mention that their restaurants were the third place, so I'll, I'll fight you for it. Um, <laughs> Um, but I hear those same kind of stories, too. So, um, but it's really a place where the community gathers um, to share, to discuss, to debate, and exchange ideas. It's a truly public space. Um, and what we know now from the success of places like Starbucks is, um, and other libraries that have successfully, successfully adopted this model 
is that in today's world, people are really going out of their way, despite Facebook, despite Second Life, despite LinkedIn, despite, 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 to seek interaction. In fact, this whole interaction today is sort of retro. It's kind of cool. You know, here we are talking to each other, right? Face to face. It's really amazing. Connie said it's like somebody in their 50s must have planned this. It's really weird. Okay. Um, so the characteristics of the third place, which I think apply to our library very much, is um, it's free or inexpensive. So Starbucks can't get all of these things. So it's free or inexpensive. Food and drink are important but not essential. That's why you see cafes and libraries these days. It's neutral ground. It's not a position that's taken here. You know, we don't, well, some might debate that perhaps I'm not as neutral as I might be. Um, but for the most part, we are pretty neutral. We don't push one particular um, political uh, side versus another. Um, it's a leveler. We don't, in, we don't um, make people feel uncomfortable because they may not have as much education as somebody else or because they may not earn as much money as somebody else. Um, so we're really trying to create a level playing field for everybody. It encourages conversation. So libraries of today, remember the libraries of the past? You know, those little study carols where in Princeton they still have these at Firestone Library where you can actually lock yourself in the study carol. Um, but, you know, we create conversation areas for people. They're highly accessible. They're easy to get to. People can walk to them. They can park near them. They're open a lot. Um, they involve regulars. Now, library people will understand this immediately because we in library land talk about our regulars all the time. Um, but there's kind of a regular group of people that frequent them that gives you a level of comfort, kind of like what I was talking about in my um, early childhood library experience. They're welcoming and comfortable, kind of a low profile, so not architecturally, um, don't create any particular architectural barriers that, that intimidate people. Um, there's a playful mood. I hope you're all feeling playful this afternoon. And a place where you can find new friends as well as old friends. So really what we want the third place to be is kind of this home away from home. And that's what we want for our library. And Oldenburg goes on in his book to give examples of good, great places. And he mentions everything except libraries in his book, which I'm sure was just an oversight on his part. Um, but I really believe that in a world, particularly where we are at this particular moment in time, where tolerance and understanding is in way too short supply these days, that libraries have a unique role to play in making sure that we are that third place that brings community and cultures together. We're places and centers of convergence. We're young and old and rich and poor and the educated and uneducated come together to learn what it means to be part of a community with a capital C. We are doing it here in Princeton every day and thousands of public libraries across the country are doing the exact same thing. We're offering programs and activities to secure our role as the community's living room, making sure that the library is the place where community and culture come together. And I have just a few examples I'll, I'll just share with you in case any of you haven't had a modern library experience. Um, most recently here in Princeton, we had a community forum a few weeks ago to talk about the governor's proposed cuts and what it meant not only here in the library, but what it meant to our schools, what it meant in terms of municipal services. It was really well attended and people got to ask questions and debate um, kind of pro and con the, the upside and the downside of each of those proposals. The Cleveland Public Library recently announced their community living room program where they have in four branches across the city discussions about health care issues and about creating healthy relationships. And, you know, those two things kind of go hand in hand. Libraries across the country have done a fabulous job during the economic downturn, doing uh, creating programs for job seekers, helping people fill out employment applications or develop resumes or get advice on starting a small business. Um, we do regularly here on election night um, uh, open the library and keep it open until the election returns come in so that the unaffiliated among us can share that experience of watching the election. And I will tell you that we have had literally hundreds, thousands of people who have come out for these events with the exception of the last gubernatorial election. 
when we only had three people that kicked. So that tells you something about what was going on that night. Um, we do community reading events where we pick a single title and we ask people to read the same book and discuss and explore the issues that are raised in, in the narrative. Um, some libraries are beginning to co-host farmers markets. I have a friend up in Wilton, Connecticut, Kathy Leeds, who has a farmers market in her library parking lot every week. And I'm happy to announce, because I never like somebody to outdo me, that we will be having one beginning mid-June right outside our library. Um, from mid-June to mid-October, we will have a farmers market every Thursday from 11 to 4 p.m. Um, Libraries in Connecticut recently with the March storm um, aftermath that Mimi showed us earlier today opened their libraries at 6 a.m. and kept them open to midnight because people in Fairfield County were without power for days and they needed a place to gather and to be together and those libraries just opened their doors and it was literally spaghetti plugs all over the place as people plugged in their computers and found, found warmth and shelter at their, at their local public libraries. Um, we've done tweet-ups, we do festivals, we do um, a wonderful environmental film festival. So we do all kinds of things to make sure that this library is the center of life in our community. And although we may not have the panache or the cash reserves of Starbucks, libraries have much more to offer than an overpriced cup of latte. In a world that's been devastated, by the irresponsible actions of banks and Wall Street speculation, libraries demonstrate day in and day out that they aren't too big to fail, but they are too precious to lose. And we're about to lose them right now in this state if the governor has his way. Libraries bring civility to our often cynical and uncivil world. Libraries build communities where none have existed before they encourage tolerance and understanding. They promote democracy. They create literate and informed people who are ready to tackle the tough issues of our times. And they make it a better place for all of us now and for future generations to come. We are today's Agora. I have no doubt about it. We're the 21st century forum. We're the community living room. And we are the real great good place. And if a picture is worth a thousand words, these next 10 photos that we're going to show you after Janice keys this up are going to be worth 10,000 words. We're just going to run through them quickly while we make the transition. And these are just all examples of things that have been going on here. I think that was last. That was Wednesday, wasn't it? Thank you, Janice. Thank you. So libraries clearly have helped me, the often bored and lonely only child, find her community. And as you've just witnessed, we do the same for countless others every day. 2,500 people through our doors most days of the week. And I invite all of you, if you haven't experienced the 21st Century Library, to find the bliss that can be found in your public library. Thank you.